Welcome, everyone. Uh, we will begin in just a moment. Uh, we're waiting for a few more people to filter in. Uh, but as we are waiting, uh, please do let us know where you're from in the chat. Looks like we have such a widespread group. That's awesome. All right. Welcome, everyone. My name is Nora McGinnis, and I co-chair the SDA Exhibitions Committee, and I'm also a teaching fellow at Indiana University, Indianapolis. For those of you new to our community, Surface Design Association is a membership nonprofit focused on contemporary fiber and textile art. We're delighted to welcome you to this week's Textile Talk, Forecast Recast, which delves into SDA's 2022 member exhibition with our juror Tanya Aguinia and award winners Joyce Gordon, Amy Usden, Esther Bornemisa, and Soraya Park. Textile Talks webinars are brought to you by the International Quilt Museum, uh, Modern Quilt Guild, Quilt Alliance, San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, Studio Art Quilt Associates, and Surface Design Association. Before we get started, a few housekeeping announcements. First, as this is a webinar, your screens and mics are not showing. We do welcome your questions, uh, and we will answer those at the end of all of the artist presentations. Please submit them in the Q&A chat box located at the bottom of your screen. We are honored to bring you free and inspiring Textile Talks programming, and we respectfully ask that you be courteous as you engage with speakers, moderators, and other participants. Your chat comments can be seen by everyone. So as a reminder, please use the Q&A for questions, the chat box for greeting others, and survey for commentary or ways that we can improve textile talks in general. Uh, if during the presentations you would prefer not to see notifications from the chat pop up at the bottom of your screen, you can just click on that chat button to toggle notifications on and off. Thanks so much everyone for joining us today. Forecast Recast, our 2022 members exhibition, is currently on view through January 27th, 2023 at the Chehalem Cultural Center in Newburgh, Oregon. The exhibition brings together artists and artworks that explore ideas of predicting, reshaping, and repredicting. Works that offer a glimpse of possible futures, re-examine historical narratives, shed light on needed social and ecological interventions, and bend inquiry towards new aims to reframe the way we view the world. First off, we're honored to present juror Tanya Aguinia, who will share comments about the exhibition and provide insights to her own art practice. Aguinia was born in 1978 in San Diego, California, and raised in Tijuana, Mexico. An artist, designer, and craftsperson now living in Los Angeles, Aguinia works with traditional craft materials like natural fibers, and collaborates with other artists and activists to create sculptures, installations, performances, and community-based art projects. Drawing on her upbringing as a binational citizen who daily crossed the border from Tijuana to San Diego for school, Aguinia's work speaks to the artist's experience of her divided identity and also aspires to tell the larger and often invisible stories of the transnational community. Welcome, Tanya. Oh, and you are muted. So if you want to just unmute <laughs> yeah, that. Everybody excited to be here. Didn't realize my hair was so messy. Um, okay, so would you like me to share my screen now? Yes, welcome. Um, you, I will turn it over to you and you can take it away. Okay, all right. So share screen. Let's see. And then slideshow. Okay, and then I'm trying to, okay, there we go. Yeah. All right, so hi everybody. Um, so when we were in our planning meeting um, to talk about the, the presentation today, um, everybody let me know that there was gonna be lots of people viewing from all over the world. So there's a little bit more, I'm sorry, those of you that are familiar with California and Mexico, there's a lot of um, images that kind of tell people where I grew up, um, thinking about the, the global possible viewership. Um, and so, yeah, so my name is Tania Guiniga, and here's an image of me in a glass suit uh, that I did a performance, a durational performance in, uh, that you can view on my website or on Art21. 
Um, so the largest thing to know about me that influences a lot of what I do is that I grew up a few blocks away from the U.S.-Mexico border. <clears throat> so I actually grew up in the part where the border cuts into the ocean um, on the Mexican side. And so I grew up in Tijuana, um, but crossed the border every day to go to San Diego on the U.S. side um, to go to school. And so crossing the largest um, port of entry in the world every single day um, from the age of four to 18. And so viewing, living through the large discrepancies between Mexico and the US, a lot of my work from very early on, since I was 19, uh, involved doing community-based work and working on migrant rights uh, since 1997. And so I am a craft-based artist. And for me, craft is art, it is also design, it is culture, it is object, it is human. And so formally, my work kind of meanders between art, design, and craft, formally, and informally, it's more about content, function, and technique. So my formal background, my training is in furniture design. Uh, so I have a master's in furniture design. And a lot of what I learned in furniture design actually crossed over in my brain into working with fiber. So a lot of things about um, the directionality and strength and thinking about what makes good engineering um, when building and when making forms um, is what I um, crossed over into my work with fiber. And so when I was reading this book not too long ago called The Life of Lines by Tim Ingold, uh, what I realized is that so much of the work that I do and the different threads that kind of make up the work that I do have to do with joinery. And so from wood to fiber to working on the border or working communities, a lot of my work is about joining two different opposite things at times. And so I wanted to kind of walk you through one of these like my explorations with one of these um, materials. And so this is kind of talking through, um, you know, process and learning and thinking about access and sharing um, through felt. And so when I started making furniture, um, one of the big things that I was known for is that I was doing wet felting on furniture. And for me, it started with thinking about my border identity, um, but then very quickly, it kind of changed into different things for me. And so quickly I started thinking about um, furniture and thinking about the industry that I was a part of at the time and how, are, how am I in dialogue with the histories that I'm, that I'm a part of. And thinking about the materials that I use, um, how do I communicate more effectively through the processes. And so I did um, wet felted chairs for a very long time and then got to a point where I thought about, you know, the artist's object and um, objectification of, of artists. Um, and I thought, what happens if I put myself through the processes that I put my furniture through? And so that was the beginning of me kind of um, going into also thinking about performance. And then from there, you know, kept thinking about the process of hand felting and what that felt like um, to be felted myself, but also to felt objects and thought about the power of touch and thought about how I could open up this whole experience so that other people could participate and thinking more about mental health and what happens when we care for one another through touch. Um, and so this is a project called um, Hand in Hand where a person felt their neighbor's hand while their hand is being felted by a neighbor. And this is a project that would happen in, all over the US, um, usually between strangers. And so kind of showing you the micro, the micro to macro of me thinking about um, felt in something that is just, you know, working on furniture all the way to turning it into something that could help communities. And so fiber for me has brought a lot of different connections and kind of opened up a lot of doorways. And so a lot of it is thinking about, you know, how does craft connect us to our ancestors, but also thinking about how are we connected to the materials, the tools, and the methods that we use and really questioning them. And so what I'm known for now is these very large scale um, fiber sculptures. And so here's one that's 20 feet tall that's currently on view at the Oakland Museum of California Art. And so in this piece, um, it's a feminist show that is currently up. And so I was asked to make a piece for that for the exhibition. And so I really wanted to think about all of the topics that 
museums won't touch that have to do with us living safely in our femme bodies. And so I asked femme identified folks to send in any um, objects that they would like um, to be included in a museum to talk about these different, you know, kind of taboo subjects that don't usually get covered or collected in museums. And all of the objects that were sent in, there was 29 different participators um, that answered the call for um, submitting something. And they also submitted writing and some people only submitted writing, some of it was anonymous. Um, and so then that kind of shows you uh, a culmination of me thinking about community based um, expanding kind of what art can do what craft can be. Um, and how we we also ask museums to be accountable for what they're putting forward and that how we use the platforms that we're given. And so the border um, is also a very big thing that happens in my life and that I'm very involved with. Um, and so for me, the border is a metaphor, it's a place, it's an identity, it's a thing at that it's also a people. And so a lot of the work that I do on the border is through Ambos, which is a project that I founded in 2016. It's art made between opposite sides. And one of the largest projects that we did was the border kipu. So thinking about the kipu, the Incan um, organizational system of strings, um, what we did was we, myself and, and my collaborators, engage people that congregate at the border, that make their living at the border or that cross daily. And we gave them a postcard with two strings saying these two strings represent the relationship between US and Mexico, ourselves at either side of the border and or our mental state while crossing and then ask people to make a knot. So we engaged over 7,000 participants over three years, talking to people that cross the border daily, which there are millions of us that do that. Um, talk to people who just hang out, you know, that are just hanging out in their cities in Mexico along the border, uh, vendors. And then everybody made a symbolic knot, which was tied to the other knots from that city to make a visual representation of our community and what we were going through um, to talk about us not going through these processes alone, which are very stigmatizing. And so people also uh, were asked to write a small reflection of their life at the border. And so the main question on the postcard was, what are your thoughts when you cross this border? But quickly realizing that not everybody at the border obviously crosses because they're not able to cross legally, they don't want to. Um, we just asked people to write a reflection of their, their experience on the border. And so here's one. It says that uh, the El Paso Juarez borderplex is a place in radiant negotiation with itself. Each day we wake up as one, our home of three states, two countries, and one heart. And so we have a massive, massive collection, like I said, over 7,000 of these um, expressing the emotion of the border. And so we zigzagged, stitching together um, this representation emotionally um, of the US-Mexico border over three years. And we also did different performances along the border, uh, sometimes with each other as collaborators, sometimes with other artists um, from border communities. And so here are myself and my friend Jackie, a mesquita um, backstrap weaving through the border fence. This is a rust print that we did of the old border fence with the Trump uh, border wall prototypes in the back, which are now demolished and gone. And so here's a rust print of the old fence. Um, and that fence was actually landing mats that were used by the US government in Vietnam and in the Gulf War. And here is a weaving made up of messages that children on the US side wrote to children on the Mexican side who were separated from their families. And so a lot of these um, more current exhibitions um, in museums, I've also been using as a, as a place where we can really share information, um, demystify mutual aid, and help people kind of get involved in, in how they can help um, with our current migrant situation um, as the global south, you know, is, is migrating up towards the north. Um, and really sharing information for people on um, how they can get involved and help educate themselves um, in a way that, like I said, is demystified. Um, and so, sorry, I went really fast, but I didn't have that much time to talk. And so a lot of what I do is really thinking about through craft, what is, and I use the word art here because for me, art and 
encompasses also craft and design, obviously. Um, so what is art, who art is for, what art can do and who gets to participate. And so here's an image um, just to kind of leave you with um, of our AMBO ceramics program, which is a program that I started in 2020. Um, so we have a trauma informed ceramics program at two LGBTQ asylum shelters in Tijuana. Um, and so a lot of it is really, you know, thinking about all of the benefits that craft has. And that is it. Okay. I hope Thanks that was so much, awesome. Tanya. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much, Tanya. Um, Astrid, I believe you were going to share the uh, slides of the, the installation of the show. And Tanya, you uh, can uh, share your, your insights and your approach to the show. Uh, so just for everyone in our audience, um, this is the show that is up at the Chehalem Cultural Center in Newburgh, Oregon. Um, it, uh, it's really gorgeous. We're really grateful to you, Tanya, and to all of the artists who participated. Um, so I'll turn it back over to you and let you speak. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, it was super hard. There was so many, such an insane amount of incredible work uh, that was submitted. So it was really difficult to get it down to, I believe, um, Astrid, was it 30 or 32 um, pieces that we were able to accept? It was, it was a very small amount compared to the what was submitted and so much of the work was so good and so a lot of it was really just thinking about you know how do I select um, works that are from diverse methods of making um, thinking about you know including works that are abstract that are figurative that are multidisciplinary um, pieces that talk about very different issues that are urgent right now to all of us um, and things that were representative of what was submitted. So if there was, you know, lots of pieces that were submitted that were abstract, then I wanted to make sure that I had a good representation of extra abstract work. Um, so really it was, um, yeah, it was really hard um, because people, people's work was so strong and so many of the pieces that were submitted also had such incredible vulnerability and urgency to the topics that they were talking about. Um, and in a lot of enduring um, other competitions, I like to really think about, um, you know, making sure that there's a wide representation from different regions um, that, you know, it is, isn't just concentrated in, in, you know, one method, one place, something like that. Um, but this was also um, anonymous. Um, as I was judging everything, I couldn't really see how many, you know, I couldn't see if pieces were made by somebody outside of the US or anything like that. Um, so yeah, so it's really wonderful to see everybody here in person um, that is is going to be talking a little bit later that one. Um, and yeah, and it was cool to see that, you know, in the end, what what came out was also fairly representative of the different methods um, that the SDA members um, engage in. Thanks so much, Tanya, uh, for both presenting your own work and giving us that um, insight into your own practice, and then also your, your thoughts on the show. We really appreciate it. Uh, so for the next segment of our textile talk, we will have short presentations from our four award winners from the show. And our first presenter is Joyce Gordon, who is the first place award winner for Women of the World. So Joyce Brustad Gordon claims that she was born with a needle in her hand. She wants to learn every creative application using textiles. Uh, Joyce has since 2018 refocused her creative energy to using applique and hand embroidered images to acknowledge social injustice and tell stories of women and girls throughout the world. And just a quick note to our viewers that her work deals with sexual violence and may be potentially disturbing to some viewers. So welcome, Joyce. I invite you to come on and share with us your work. Well, thank you. I am absolutely, I can't believe that I am part of this exhibit when I have seen all the beautiful pieces. Um, I am humbled as a, a 73 year old woman, I'm gonna cry, who is fine, I'm finding my voice. 
And at the same time, I'm helping all these women express their voice. Um, and their, their lives have been not so good and they um, have been silenced. So I wanted to give them a voice and came up with this plan to, to do these pieces, but they were gonna be full-sized with people walking into an exhibit and they would have to be confronted full-sized by these individuals. And eventually I talked to um, Jane Dunwald, I uh, had a, a wonderful um, opportunity to have a, like a 40 minute talk with her when she came up to this area that I live in, which is in Washington state. And she loved my idea and really encouraged me to go forward with it. And it really wasn't until 2018 that I decided to go ahead and start them. Um, I was really worried about 20 years ago about the feeling vulnerable, my feeling vulnerable, um, and kind of like a feeling of nakedness to express myself and to bring these women forward. And I was worried about re-victimizing them by doing so. So I try when I make them to give them just a, a really, I, I, I try, I'd make them out of, out of fabric that I hand uh, embroider and then um, uh, needle turn uh, applique. I, I could do it a different way where you bond them, but I thought that wasn't uh, really very, there wasn't a very good idea to do it that way because they didn't, they didn't look as good. This way they look more like they're loved and they're deeply, dearly loved by me. So I, I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joyce. Um, so next we will hear from Amy Uston, who is our second place award winner for Picnic at Dead Horse Bay. From Minnesota, or, excuse me, from Minnesota, Amy Usden weaves new narratives onto vintage fiber nets, honoring the revolving intersections of past and present. So Amy, I welcome you to come on and join us and share with us your work. Uh, thank you, Tanya and SDA for including me in this beautiful exhibit. And also thanks to um, Katie Spain from the Cultural Center who, which you can see from the photos, did a beautiful job. Um, installing the work. It's a remarkable show. Um, in my work, I needle weave and knot mental and physical landscapes onto worn fiber artifacts, uh, most often fly nets for horses, which you can see in the back images, and fishing nets, which is the piece that's in the show. Uh, their transformation creates new narratives that are informed by um, unexpected associations that the objects previous lives evoke. Uh, weaving the old into the new honors the revolving intersections of past and present. And for me, uh, the nets have an inherent characteristic that encourages an empathic response and that offers a point of connection and um, shared humanity. The piece in this show is titled Picnic at Dead Horse Bay. You can switch the slide. It's built on three fishing nets that are structurally similar to those that have been made and mended for thousands of years. Um, I don't really think of my work in terms of mending, but more of tending. Um, I began weaving during my years of elder care where holding together these ragged fiber bodies kind of paralleled the care of my parents and it gave me some semblance of being able to solve something. Um, these are the first three panels of an ongoing installation inspired by Dead Horse Bay in Brooklyn, New York. And if you don't know the history of Dead Horse, in the mid 1800s, the streets of New York were filled with um, overworked horses and eventually horse carcasses. Uh, Barren Island just off the coast became home to rendering plants where they would process the horses into fertilizer or glue and then they would toss the boiled chopped bones into the water. That's the name Dead Horse Bay. The invention of cars meant fewer horses to process, so the plants eventually closed in the 1920s. And soon after, uh, Parks Commissioner Robert Moses literally bulldozed his way through the city in the name of urban renewal. One of his big ideas in the 1950s was to connect Barren Island to the mainland through the use of landfill. And um, he did this by raising entire neighborhoods of people who didn't have the time or the means to um, 
pack up their things. Um, so anything left behind was dumped into the water offshore as part of this landfill. And the landfill is so poorly capped that it still continually leaks the broken remnants of these lives onto the beach. You can find everything from you know, razors to shoe leather to toys to broken china to Chinese glass bottles and still the bones of these horses. And um, it's quite a moving experience for me to walk along the beach. I think Dead Horse provides a cautionary tale that the past resurfaces um, sometimes unexpectedly and often consequentially, and that we really need to take better care of the land and of each other. Uh, the beach now, I think, is still closed due to recently discovered radioactive contamination. But before that, um, visitors would scavenge the beach, scavenge, scavenge the beach without necessarily um, knowing the history um, or thinking about the disrupted lives underfoot. And, you know, in the same way, this piece doesn't really reveal its narrative, um, which I think speaks to how easy it is to gloss over histories. And if you happen to be in LA, uh, two new panels of this installation will be hanging in Ruinous Ravishment at Patricia Suido Gallery that opens January 14th with um, two other artists who do incredible amazing, um, surface design, Christopher Miles Ceramics and Jamie Vasta, who does glitter paintings. So um, thank you again for including me in the show. Thanks so much, Amy. It's great to hear a little bit more about your work. Uh, so next we have Esther Bornemisa, who is our third place winner for Wasteboro. And Esther Bornemisa is a fiber artist living in Budapest, Hungary, and working with newspaper, vintage cloth, and other soft found materials with the processes of painting, dyeing, and machine stitching. So welcome, Esther. Hello. Uh, greetings to everyone from Budapest, Hungary. Uh, I'm also very, I feel very honored to be part of the program. And uh, uh, this piece, as the title also suggests, is about waste, uh, which are mainly textile, plastics, and paper. So these are the material I chose for this, this piece. Um, I used uh, vintage uh, clothing bits that I inherited from my family. And <clears throat> they are kind of falling out from like cracks from of a wall. And the wall is created of painted and shrunk um, um, plastic sheets that is used at uh, um, buildings, building stuff. So <clears throat> um, I, I use these materials because of my concerns about the waste, and especially because I'm a city dweller, um, how a city. Um, uh, manages the waste. It is a crucial thing in the in the life of the city, and there have been lots of problems with this. And <clears throat> it is very difficult to make a city sustainable if the um, waste management isn't um, good or sustainable. So <clears throat> I use this old um, vintage uh, clothing bits um, because. They are all from my family, and my grandmothers and great grandmothers used to use them for their lifetime or for many, many years at least. And if you think about what we do today, we are hoarding lots of things, buying new and new things to be good in fashion and to be up to date. But since we buy so much, we also drop into the waste so much and it gives, it makes a very bad <clears throat> circle. And I wanted to um, draw the attention to this kind of uh, thing. Um, yes, if you could please show the next one. I wanted to talk a little bit my, about my other work that is also related to the work that I have at the forecast, recast ex exhibition. Um, this installation was shown in, in France, in Alsace, in a 
a gallery that used to be a 13th century church, um, which has been abandoned after the French Revolution. And since there was a small river nearby, later a um, paper mill was established there. And after a time, the paper mill totally grew around the church. And since it was abandoned, I just used it for storage and machinery. And a few years ago, maybe 20 years ago, a group of local people, friends of uh, this area, decided to turn it back to a national heritage. And they <clears throat> raised some money to restore it and use it as a gallery. And since the church is really in the middle of a paper mill, they decided to show only paper art. And when I was invited and I, I saw some images, I've never been there before, but when I saw the images of this church, I said immediately, yes, without knowing what I will do there. <clears throat> And I was also offered to use some of the paper that is produced uh, in the mills. They only uh, rework uh, waste paper and they, they produce uh, various kinds of cardboards. So I, I worked for there for a week about and cut out, if you can see this um, life-size uh, abstract human, humanoid figures that all have a little window in them that has another map in them, which relates to the big panels. These big panels that surround them are about three meters high. And these are earlier works of mine, all made of newspaper and they are the city dwellers who, who have a little part of the city in themselves. Uh, like we all have a kind of a city inside us, a pattern of movements and passes and where we go and how we go. And when we get lost or the circumstances get changed, we have to change our patterns, to dig into earlier memories, to find out how did I get there when this construction wasn't there, and so and so. So we ha always have to rework and, and reconsider our patterns of movement. And this is a physical thing, and I use it as a metaphor for finding our identity both uh, physically, mentally, and spiritually. And also since I'm a self-trained artist, because I was trained as a mathematician and worked for 20 years as a mathematician, uh, I found these maps and juxtaposing them and layering them and trying to find out which layer is what and where am I? So I use this as a metaphor for my own finding my way to be an artist and to express my feelings about um, the city where I live and, and my relations uh, to it. So, and I think there is one more slide uh, showing the transparencies, because uh, also as in, in my piece, uh, uh, the forecast recast exhibition, I have more layers and the top layer is a little bit distant from the back layer. So you can see through and you can play with how you focus your eyes. If you focus on the front layer, you see a city map, but if you focus on the on the back side, then you see all the details of the garment bits and, and this wall kind of thing. And here you have maybe an impression how you feel when meandering among these personalities and the panels and see through and, and play with focusing your, your eyes on the front thing or the thing behind or 
the scene behind, behind, and behind. So there are so many layers, all, all in the history, all in the in our lives, all in the ways how we navigate ourselves in the in between uh, these things. And I wanted to give an impression of this kind of seeing everything together like a holistic thing uh, in this uh, uh, installation at the uh, Aspach Gallery in Assens. Thank you. Thanks so much, Esther. All right, so lastly, we'll hear from Soraya Park, who's the winner of our Award of Excellence for Spirit Guide. Soraya is an interdisciplinary artist who works across the mediums of fiber, print, and fashion design. Her work asks important questions regarding consumerism, post-colonialism, and societal waste. Soraya currently resides in New York's Hudson Valley, where she lives and works as a professional artist and educator in the field of textiles and indigenous studies. So welcome, Soraya. Thank you, Nora, and thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today to share my work with the community at SDA. It's such a great honor to have one of my pieces selected for this exhibition. Um, as Nora mentioned, I'm an interdisciplinary artist. Um, I work across those mediums of fiber, print, and fashion design. Um, I'm an artist and educator at Parsons School of Design here in New York City. Um, this particular piece in the exhibition is called Spirit Guide. It's part of a much larger body of work that I embarked upon as a way to reconnect with my Native ancestors. Each piece in the series represents the spirits of my ancestors. The pieces in the series combine many methods of craft, textile making, and surface design, such as weaving, paper making, and print making. The process of printing my textile paper leaves behind a memory of the woven cloth drawing the viewer in to see the intricacies of the textiles itself. In my years of working as a textile artist, I find that many people overlook or take for granted the, the labor of cloth. Um, we wear textiles on our bodies every day and rarely do we consider who made the cloth, how is it constructed, or the histories behind the making. I find that the works in this series confront the viewer and ask them to take a closer look at the materials that make up their own lives. Next slide, please. So most of my work explores my indigeneity and asks important questions around waste and systems of value. Growing up as a mixed race person, I lived between two worlds within very, two very different worldviews. I'm a member of the Chiricahua Apache Nation. My father's ancestors have resided in the region of the Southwest uh, since time immemorial. I see my work as a conduit to my native ancestors. The original piece selected for the show was called Ghost Dancer. This piece on the right is very significant to me because it was one of the first pieces I created after my father's passing. It, uh, the act of creating this piece helped me to see that our spirits and the spirits of our ancestors are still connected. The ghost dance is a very significant traditional ceremony that's practiced across most of the western part of Turtle Island. This sacred ritual originated to reunite the living with the spirits of our ancestors and was meant to bring those spirits to fight against the westward expansion of colonization, to bring peace and unity to the indigenous communities of the west. This process of making has brought me peace and a sense of unity with my father and my native ancestors. Next slide. This is just another shot of Ghost Dancer. Next slide. Um, the pieces you see on this last side are from another body of work entitled Printing with Waste. Every year, 92 million tons of textile waste end up in landfills. After years of working as a textile artist and seeing this waste creation firsthand, I wanted to make work that addressed this problem. All of the pieces in this series are made from damaged textiles, transforming them into new forms. And again, asking the viewer to take a closer look at materials and fabric to see their inherent value rather than something to be disposed of. Thank you so much for allowing me to share my work today. Thanks so much to you as well, Soraya. Um, and a big thank you uh, again to Tanya and all of our presenters today. 
Uh, we now we are right on the schedule, so we have time to answer some audience questions. Uh, so as a reminder, please enter your questions in the Q&A um, and leave the chat for comments uh, if you just want to leave a comment for an artist. Uh, so I'll invite all of our presenters to um, come on, turn their video back uh, on and come on screen and we'll do Q&A and discussion. Welcome back, everyone. All right, uh, to start off with, Tanya, we have a question for you um, from Lee McLean uh, asking, do you consider the scale of your of the work when you are making selections for a show or for this show in particular? Yeah, for this show in particular, um, I had to. There was a lot of larger pieces that um, I wanted to include or pieces that were more site specific or installation based, um, but the space didn't have the gallery footprint didn't have enough um, yeah, space for us to include all of these bigger pieces. So unfortunately, um, for this one, I did have to kind of pare down to a mixture, a sampling um, of different sizes rather than have a lot of large pieces. Thanks, Tanya. Uh, also, Joyce, we have a question for you. Uh, Nancy Riffle appreciates your figurative work and asks, um, did you make the figures and then apply them to the larger pieces, or did you embroider the figures directly onto the, the larger backgrounds? Oh, and you're, you're still muted. All right. There we I, are. First, I first make the figures and um, I make a guide. So and I put them back to the linen, I'm able to have them exactly where I want them. And so I first do that, and then I um, hand order them on, and then I work on their faces and, um, and all the details. So they're, awesome. they're all handy, they're all, you know, they're all uh, uh, appliqued. Thanks so much. And I actually have a, a follow-up question for you as well. Uh, do you, I'm interested, do you see a connection in your work between using hand stitching and embroidery, which at least in many Western traditions are, are kind of traditionally done by women and using those, those techniques to tell the stories of women and girls? Is that something you're, you see in your work? What, what I've heard is that women do protesting <laughs> with, with embroidery and with textiles. And I thought that's basically what I'm doing. I'm a one woman protester who's telling stories, but, but not my stories. I'm telling the stories of women from the past and from unfortunately the present. And so that's what I, I believe that's what I'm doing. Thank you. Thanks Joyce. All right, uh, also a technical question for you, Esther. So can you explain uh, your technique and particularly how you accomplish the gridded stitching? Um, yes, I, so I use, use newspaper and I use uh, water soluble fabric or paper, whatever it is it's called. <clears throat> so I, I copy my pattern on the water soluble put the newspaper on it, stitch around the lines that I drew, and then I cut out the streets. So they are usually maps. And so the, the street system comes out and the blocks, the houses, they remain and they are stitched on the water soluble. And then I stitch it to and fro 100 times <laughs> and then I get the grid. And then there's the grid that keeps the whole thing together so I can wash out the water soluble fabric. And of course, before I use uh, this, I have to seal the newspaper. Otherwise it would be disintegrating the water as well. So I, I use a very, very, very binder, acrylic binder to keep it a little bit more um, resistant to the water. That's it. 
Thanks, Esther. Um, and also uh, going along that that same idea of the grid, there's another question for you um, about how your background as a mathematician helps or inspires your art. You mentioned that briefly, <laughs> if you want to talk about it a little bit more. Yes, I, I actually have been thinking quite a lot about it because mathematics is something very rational, but also it is also about the instinct how you approach a solution or which way you start to to go with it so how i work it is the, the ideas are very instinctive and but then i think about it a lot if i go this way uh, if i go that way uh, and then on and on and on and then some kind of times i combine these ideas how so i do a lot of <laughs> thinking but the original ideas and of course finally the visual whole when i when i'm getting close to finish it then then it is again very much on the instinct how, how does it look is it is it balanced is there contrast blah 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 and, and so on and uh, then there, again, not so much thinking, but much more feeling if it looks good or not. <laughs> Thanks so much, Esther. Uh, Tanya, back to you uh, for a couple of questions. Um, so Kathy Karen is, is interested to hear about uh, the children's reaction to that shared cross-border textiles piece that you mentioned in your slideshow. Um, so there was two parts to it. So one of it was working with children on the US side and really figuring out how to em empower and help parents talk to their children about family separation and what that means um, and how that kind of spans not just, you know, um, it was at the time when the Trump administration was taking children away from, from migrants that were trying to seek asylum. Um, but also talking to them about, you know, how deportation also separates families, how forced migration, how poverty, all these different things are also forms of family separation. Um, so that was one component is, you know, like figuring out how can we help, you know, families in the U.S. really talk about this. Um, and then the other part was when it got to the Mexican side of the border. And so for that, um, a lot of it was because it's something that's, you know, can be re-traumatizing for children to read, you know, messages from other children, especially that are in a more privileged and safe situation. Um, and a lot of the stuff also, you know, resonates deeply with adults, not just children. Um, a lot of it is just setting the piece up. So for like that image, it was tied onto the fence and it was left there for hours for people to engage with it on their own. And so we had to translate anything that was written in English, we had to translate it and write it with a Sharpie in Spanish. So people could also read it in Spanish and then kind of just step away and let it be there and give people, you know, respectful space to do whatever they wanted. A lot of people cried. A lot of people just, you know, stood there for a super long time explaining to their children or reading to their children what the messages said. Um, and that piece um, was donated to Families Belong Together Mexico. And so it travels to different asylum shelters. And so it takes turn, um, yeah, just being in different spaces to help people connect and understand that, you know, they're not alone. And that um, when they do make it to the U.S. safely, that the policies don't necessarily represent the views of people in the U.S., um, but yeah, for the most part, it's kind of guiding people and letting them have space. Thanks, Tanya. I appreciate it. Uh, Soraya, we will come over to you. So you have a couple of different questions, which I will um, combine. But can you explain more about the processes you employ in the making of your work? Um, and folks are interested in both your monoprints and your textiles. Oh, great. Um, Yes, I started out my career as a textile designer uh, for apparel. Um, all of my textiles, um, I, I originally paint and I process them through silkscreen. Um, but then I kind of started to transition over into more fine art processes. 
um, where I started combining um, my weaving with paper making and then into print making. Um, so it's it's a very multifaceted process. Um, but for the first um, series that you saw, the Spirit Figures fury, uh, series, um, I start weaving like small tapestry uh, weavings on a small portable loom. Um, and then I pass them through the paper pulp and it creates this kind of woven paper. Um, and then from there, um, when they're taken off of the loom, they have a very kind of irregular shape, um, which is very figurative to me. Um, and then when it's passed through the printing press, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of pressure uh, that it goes through and it, it leaves that imprintation, that embossment of the weaving onto the paper. Um, and it picks up those really intricacies, like the tiny little minute details down to the fibers, um, which I found that that people really respond to and come up to and are really intrigued by the, the detail that I'm able to get um, in those pieces. Um, with the printing with waste, um, it's a much larger story, but I've been affected by climate change a few times. Um, but in 2018, my house was hit by a tornado and um, a bunch of my archive was damaged um, in, that, in that ordeal. Um, so a lot of my original textiles that I had developed um, were water damaged and they were still very symbolic to me and I couldn't let go of them. And I held on to them for quite a long time trying to figure out a way to use them. Um, so I was trying this project of reprinting over my printed fabrics and I was trying to cut off um, the damaged edges that got water damaged. Um, and as those pieces were kind of piling up into these beautiful piles, I, I, it kind of sounds funny, but the, the fabric was kind of speaking to me and kind of telling me what to do with them. So I took them to the press um, and I started printing with those damaged materials um, and it, it created a very kind of unexpected result. So that's, that's a little bit about those processes. Thanks so much, Soraya. And I'm so glad that you were able to take something and make new work out of such a heartbreaking experience. <laughs> All right. Um, and over to you, Amy. So uh, a technical question as well. How do you go about weaving into the nets? Or could you just talk about your process and technique a little bit more? With the fishing nets, I usually um, stretch them on a wall. The nets in this particular show are grid based and I just needle weave in and out. Um, it's really feels more like stitching to me than weaving. Uh, when I use horsefly nets, I pin them to foam boards. Um, and again, just needle weave in and out between um, the ropes that exist. Thanks. And I had a uh, follow up question as well. Is, do you have a background in weaving? Is that how you were drawn to using the nets or did the nets come first and then the technique after? I, I wove as a child and then I took an inexplicable 40 year break. And when I wanted to start weaving again, I didn't have any equipment and I hadn't thought about textiles in years. So I didn't realize you could weave on something as simple as a cardboard loom. I mean, I totally forgotten all of that. And I happened to have a net and I, a, a horse fly net and I just really appreciated its structure. It has, um, vertical bands with horizontal ropes in between. And I realized that I could use those as warps and as warp. And then um, I just started discovering all these other meanings and attachments as I was working. That sounds great. Thank you. Uh, so, oh, go, go ahead. Okay. Um, I also... Oh, I also want to open it up to uh, the five of you as well, if you have any questions uh, for each other or anything burning on your mind before we wrap up for today. All right, uh, so I also have one last question for you all. We have uh, just a couple more minutes. Um, so in, you know, a very, um, in about like two sentences or, or 30 seconds, uh, you all have such vibrant practices and really impactful practices. I'm curious to know, and I think our audience is too, what is next for you? Um, either what are you most excited to get back to in your studio right now um, or something upcoming? So whoever wants to uh, jump in first and we'll go around. Well, I'll, I'll speak. Um, there are too many stories to be told. And I have a, a 
file cabinet full of my little three by five cards that I write down all kinds of ideas and what I hear on like NPR, listen to the radio. And I wanna bring those stories forward in images. And so I am very excited about working with uh, rape in the military, for instance. And, and so I'm working on producing um, a font that's a human font that spells out rapists. So this, this is kind of the work that I do. And it's probably why I don't talk about it often because it makes people uncomfortable. But I'm very excited about this process that I'm working on. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Joyce. Okay. Um, I started my textile career as a quilter and about 25 years ago. <clears throat> and uh, recently I looked through my storage and I found a lot of old quilts, which uh, I don't want to throw out. I don't want to sell them because they are not me uh, anymore. So I decided, I was thinking quite a lot and tried a lot of things what to do with them. And recently I find that I can do some kind of <laughs> plastic surgery on them. Uh, <laughs> so I add, at, at different layers and I changed them a little bit. They were very colorful at the beginning. So I tried to mute the color a little bit and then add certain things and find kind of narratives behind it or not, not narratives, but processes or, or flow or something going on. And I like the process that I add something, it looks totally different. It gives an idea that it looks like something that resembles a, a situation we are now in. And then I try to build it towards that, but not too much, not, not too little. And I am playing with this. This piece behind me is one of the first ones in this, in this kind of attempt. And I, I'm, I really like it because uh, Yes, <laughs> when you when you are when you are aging, you start to think about what will happen to your storage. <laughs> I don't want to leave a big problem for my children. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I, they are waiting for a little facelifting. <laughs> Thanks so much, Esther. I can go next really quick. Um, so I'm I'm first very excited to go to Amy's show in LA. So I get to, I'm so lucky I get to see her in person. Uh, and so that's super exciting. Um, and I am starting a new project um, that's a collaboration using um, ice dyed um, garments and embroidery um, to raise money for one of the shelters that I work with in Mexico, one of the asylum shelters. So yeah, I'm just super excited to, to keep going and um, help people. And yeah. And, and also I, before we like get cut off, I also just want to say how honored I am to be here with all of you and to share space with you. And it's just really beautiful way to start the new year. I think some people mentioned that um yeah it's a lovely way to to get this year started right so it feels really nice to be in sisterhood with you all and congratulations thank you go um I have thanks a, so much tanya yeah go ahead we're all right thank you tanya um i have a grouping of um pieces in mind that continue to draw on Matt's empathic objects kind of centering on anxiety and isolation and some of the collective things we've all been dealing with the last few years. So that's what I'm up to. Thanks, Amy. And Soraya. I have multiple projects going on, uh, preparing for a solo show in the fall of 2023. And I'm also continuing to develop um, this cluster of courses on indigenous fashion and land-based practices. And I'm writing a textbook on indigenous fashion. So that's keeping me really busy. So that's what I'm up to. Sounds like it. 
Well, thank you all again for um, coming today and spending time with us. Um, I really appreciated it and our uh, larger community really appreciated hearing about your work. Um, we also want to give a quick shout out as we end to our sponsors and to SDA and SACWA for hosting us. Thank you. Uh, and just a reminder that Textile Talks are a free weekly program uh, and we encourage all of you um, who come and enjoy them to consider supporting them with a donation. Uh, the recording of today's talk will be available on YouTube next week. Uh, also, next Wednesday, Textile Talks will host a discussion of highlights from the Frank Klein collection. So please do be able or please do be sure to tune in for that as well. That will be hosted by Sakwa. So thank you all again and have a good afternoon. Take care. Mm -hmm.